to hear what they heard. Um, people were uh, mesmerized by the, the amount of information that was brought forward. He restrained and sexually assaulted his victims before killing them. He then staged their bodies and photographed them. The grisly details surrounding the final moments of Bruce MacArthur's victims were, were read out on the first day of the serial killer sentencing hearing. And a warning, some viewers may find the information disturbing. John Lancaster joins us live now from the University Avenue Courthouse. And John, what more did we learn today? Well, Dwight, even before this hearing began, people inside that sixth floor courtroom behind me were warned this will get graphic. In the end, we learned what happened to those eight men, how MacArthur chose most of them because of their Middle Eastern ethnicity, how two of them were selected because MacArthur hoped they wouldn't be reported missing at all, and how MacArthur slipped through the hands of police twice before he was eventually arrested. For seven years, a killer preyed on men in Toronto's gay village. One by one, these eight men vanished without a trace between 2010 and 2017. Then came a break. These security cameras captured partially obscured images of an older model red minivan with unique trim pulling up outside the home of Andrew Kinsman. The 49-year-old man got inside and was never seen again. Inside his apartment, a clue though, the name Bruce penciled in on the day of the disappearance. As friends and families searched for kinsmen, police used a Ministry of Transportation database to narrow down the owners of similar red minivans whose first names were Bruce. MacArthur's name stood out due to his previous run-ins with police over allegations of domestic violence. His vehicle was found weeks later in a wrecker's yard. Inside, DNA belonging to MacArthur and several of the missing men. A search of MacArthur's apartment revealed another trove of evidence, a kit containing duct tape, ties, and syringes, and hundreds of pictures, some of kinsmen from years earlier when the two were friends, and worse, so-called staged photos of the dead, missing men, wearing this fur coat and fur hat. Hearing what I heard, it was gruesome and it was detailed, but then again, these, these um, family members and friends and colleagues needed to know. The courtroom was told it was likely all of the men were strangled. But the court heard how MacArthur slipped through the hands of police twice before being caught. In 2013, he was questioned after Majid Kayan disappeared. And in 2016, a man called 911 claiming MacArthur had tried to strangle him. In both cases, MacArthur was released. Many of the men had met MacArthur through dating apps. At least two were never reported missing. One was homeless, the other living underground for fear of deportation. Police later found what little they had, pieces of jewelry, in MacArthur's apartment. This is his bed where it's believed they were killed. Now it's left a, an, you know, an aura of distrust within the community of people and, and dating and relationships and talking about the mental and physical strains that it has put on people. People are, are hesitant to go out. Now, the sentencing continues tomorrow, Dwight, here at the University Avenue Courthouse. We also heard today about a shocking potential of a ninth victim, how MacArthur was under surveillance shortly before his arrest, and investigators watched as he brought a man into his apartment at Thorncliffe Park, a man they only identified as John. Fearing the worst, police burst through the doors of that apartment and found John tied to MacArthur's bed. Equally frightening is the fact that MacArthur had already, at this point, made eight electronic files of photographs of his eight prior victims. And while John lay in that bed, MacArthur had prepared a ninth electronic file titled John. Police believe he could have been the next victim. Reporting live outside the University Avenue Courts, I'm John Lancaster. John, thank you. Now, after the statement of facts were read out, court took a break until afternoon then began victim impact statements. And we'll bring you those details coming up at 6.30. For now, we've put together some words of remembrance about some of the eight men from their friends and family. Take a listen. We have only seven liter or eight liters of water for 37 days traveling time. On that time, he never no one give to anybody to water because they're serving because the waters everybody's needed but he is give to other people 
he was a very special person. He was very beautiful. He was a, a great, uh, generous person with his time. He gave a lot to the HIV and AIDS uh, organizations. We would always pretend he was our baby. I want the best of Andrew present in my life and in my community till I'm done. He was a scrapper, um, so that's why I was sort of surprised that he was one of the victims, because he was, he was street savvy. And if there were any issues we were having with anybody, he would sort of protect us. I worked with him for close to a decade, uh, up until 2008. Uh, we worked on the same line together. We went on camping trips together. Uh, I remember taking him to his first Blue Jay game. The magnitude of grief and loss is indescribable. He was a very sweet, uh, soft person. Really, um, I want to say he was calm, but uh, I mean, at the time that I knew him, he was also going through some challenges, so he wasn't like completely relaxed, but <laughs> he had a calm nature about him, very curious, very philosophical, um, a little intense even, maybe. Salim touched a lot of people and um, had very, you know, um, impactful relationships with the workers that he worked with, as well as the peers that participated in the programs that he was in. Those words of remembering, remembrance for five of MacArthur's eight victims. You can find more on what we know about all eight men online. Just head to cbc.ca slash Toronto. So we have to go through that whole debris field to find any potential evidence that we need to look at further. Take a look at that, a scene of devastation in Caledon where investigators continue to sift through the debris of a home blown to pieces by a blast early Sunday morning. A 54-year-old man was killed in the explosion tonight. Some families are seeing the full extent of the damage, Talia Ricci spent the day in Caledon and has the latest now on the investigation. With police taped down and the debris strewn across the street slowly beginning to clear, for some residents today, it was their first glimpse at the scene that startled a community awake. This is the first time I'm looking at it actually. And uh, we just saw that there was the house was gone, right? So you're in shock. Pretty well, my kids were saying I was having a panic attack because I couldn't catch my breath. A home leveled to its foundation. The man who died was the only person inside at the time. Residents say he was a familiar and friendly face in the tight-knit community. Yeah, he was very jolly, friendly. Uh, uh, nothing, couldn't say nothing bad about him. Fire crews evacuated the area surrounding the blast immediately afterwards. Residents tell CBC News they still don't know when they'll be able to return home. Thank you. They were good. Yeah? Yeah. All our pictures are down off the walls, yeah. things smashed inside. I couldn't believe it. It actually blew the doors open on the china cabinets and everything. At least seven to nine homes sustained serious damage, but around 22 homes were damaged in total. We're talking walls that shifted, roofs that lifted up and dropped back down, and lots of broken windows. But even taking a step away from the pylons and the tape, you can still see pieces of roof on the ground. We've had a high order explosion here. So the blast pressure wave that went through here was more than a thousand meters per second. So our debris field is very large. An excavator is sifting through debris at the property where the explosion happened. They still aren't sure whether or not it was accidental. Crews now face the task of going to every home in the evacuated area to document damage. Sometimes you'll see us on our hands and knees going through areas because we don't want to disrupt certain areas. Throughout these difficult days, neighbors have come together to offer help. There wasn't much that I could offer the community, but I've got the, the business if they needed a drink. If I could do anything, I was here for them. Proving what residents in Caledon already knew, that they have each other's backs. You look out for one another. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Caledon. A daycare in the West End was forced to evacuate after three children were hurt when part of the ceiling collapsed. The injuries were minor and parents were called to pick up their children, but fire crews say they are concerned about the structural integrity of the building 
The city's building inspector was on the scene. She could not say where the snow buildup caused part of the ceiling to fall, but said it will likely be considered as a factor in the collapse. Toronto residents are still cleaning up after that big winter storm, and those piles of snow are now melting away. We'll talk about how there's new fears of flooding coming up. Secondary students from across the province rallied today to protest cuts to the student assistant program by the Ford government. It just really, it just really shows that school is really expensive and that we can't afford it and that we really need help from our government to, to pay for education. To me, it's just extraordinarily unjust that those people who are already marginalized don't have the help from our government, who should be helping them, to lift themselves up higher. Hundreds of students and their supporters marched to Queen's Park. Some of the issues they spoke out against included the end to a six-month interest-free grace period on loans after graduation, as well as a new rule giving students the choice to opt out of fees that fund campus groups, student newspapers, and school events. Another change making waves at colleges and universities, the province's decision to eliminate a program that gives free tuition to low-income students. Exclusive data obtained by CBC shows just how popular that program really was. Valerie Ouellette explains. After years of shuttling students around as an Uber driver, Mohamed Hussein is now driving himself to campus. The 40-year-old father of two just went back to school to become a software developer. It was a dream, you know, as a newcomer, we take the opportunity and build ourselves. A dream he says was only possible because of Ontario's free tuition program, which paid for all of his classes this semester at Centennial College. The program was just cancelled by the Ford government and replaced by a mix of grants and loans for low-income students. I feel really stressed, I mean, and it's very disappointing. He's among the more than 234,000 students who had their full tuition paid for by the Ontario government. According to new data obtained by CBC, that's more than 40% of all full-time domestic students in the province. What the numbers do not show is how many new students registered. The Canadian Federation of Students says what wasn't measured was the impact on those already enrolled. We need to be looking at currently enrolled students. How many of them were able to quit a part-time job and focus solely on their studies because of this grant? How many of them didn't need to access mental health resources this year because they weren't worried? The Ontario government estimates the average cost of tuition for college is just over $2,700 a year. The top 10 schools in the province with the highest ratios of students getting free tuition are all colleges. Loyalist College in Belleville had the highest ratio at 73 percent. Some colleges told CBC News they have other programs to help students financially. The president of Boreal College says he is taking a wait-and-see approach. The financial aid will still be there. I, I, think, um, I think the criteria for what is uh, repayable is, is what really will affect the, the students. So the funding will be there for the students to get those uh, diplomas or degrees. So I think that's a, a huge uh, advantage for the students. So I think the, um, what the students are have to weigh is uh, look at it as an investment uh, into their future. Other schools told CBC it's too early to tell what the impact of these changes will be. They say they've been invited to technical briefings by the ministry to go over details and voice concerns. Valérie Wallet, CBC News, Toronto. Doug Ford's cuts and privatization will make things worse for people. We will not be privatizing any of the services referenced today by Andrea Horvath. Dueling viewpoints and one firing. The NDP continues to sound off on leaked documents they say show the PCs are heading towards health care privatization. The PCs deny that's the path they are on. Coming up, we try to clear the air amid dozens of unanswered questions. It says approved. It's approved. past tense. There are aspects of this that we are considering we are still working on it to make sure that we get it right that continues what i said last week is true today where it says approved where it thank says you. approved thank you, thank you. hot at queen's park today as we just saw yeah. there call it and hot outside a 30 degree swing in temperatures 
in just a few days, call it. Yeah, I don't want to give anyone flashbacks, Dwight, but that's <laughs> right. It was very cold just a few days back. Remember that in Toronto when it was minus 23? Yeah, that was just back at the end of January, last day of January. And this is a very young month that we're seeing right now into February. And such a contrast in terms of the temperatures today, this afternoon up to 12 degrees, a record for this date. The old record is 11 from 1991. But the other thing I want to show you is the contrast between the temperatures just across the province. So between Toronto and what's happening over towards the northwest, it's about a 35 degree temperature difference. And we have seen just in these few days from the 31st, to today about a 33 degree difference so just kind of imagine if overnight one night it was zero and the next day the afternoon high was 33 okay it didn't happen in 24 hours but it's been significant of where that pendulum has been swinging and this is where we are right now our current temperatures nine degrees in toronto and mississauga so cooling down a little bit as rain showers are overtaking the area just to the west of us and coming in through the evening we'll see these kind of tapering off after midnight tonight some of this light rain and then we'll get into a gradual clearing trend we go down to zero, so the temperature is falling off, and it's not going near 12 degrees for tomorrow afternoon. In fact, we'll see kind of a mix of sun and cloud, and the high will be just above freezing there at one degree. We have another system that's going to be coming in this week. Could be a significant freezing rain event. I'm going to talk more about that a little later in the show, Dwight. We'll check back with you. Thank you, Colette. You're welcome. Now, with the warmer temperatures, all that snow we got last week is now melting, leaving city streets a mess and raising concerns about flooding. City Hall reporter Lauren Pelly joins us live from the site of a giant sinkhole. A big question, has it been filled in yet, Lauren? Well, as you can see, there's a big truck behind me right now. They're planning to put some cement in tonight, but it was about four feet deep earlier today. There was actually a car stuck in it this morning on this side street here uh, near Church and King. Now, this is just the latest of the many issues that have been popping up from this wacky weather we've had this week. But in some neighborhoods, it's those piles of snow that are still the biggest concern. Stella Daskalakis says this sidewalk near her mother's East End home has been like this for days. I did call the city and they said it would be cleared within 36 hours. They apologized. They didn't realize that it hadn't been cleared. This morning, still the same thing. She says that's leaving the neighborhood's elderly residents housebound. My mom is a senior with a walker. She hasn't been able to get out to do groceries, errands, anything. She lives right beside a senior's home. Everyone is stuck inside because this is the main street that goes up to the grocery store, to the shopping malls, to the bus stops. How are they supposed to get there? While some neighborhoods are still digging out from the snow, others are bracing for flooding as the piles start to melt. So I came in today just to make sure that everything's clean and dry. This Danforth gift shop owner keeps some of the stock in the basement of her store, a spot that's flooded before. I get a lot of runoff coming down to here. I usually have a pail that I scrape that off into. But even when that's totally free and open with the snow that's been up outside, it, it quite often flows straight down into here. It's a similar scene across the city, with piles becoming puddles, all thanks to rising temperatures. We're still out there clearing up from the storm. This city spokesperson says the flip-flopping weather adds an extra challenge. We've had crews out all weekend uncovering catch basins uh, because of this warming temperatures we're having, where we could have potential for flooding. So I think we uncovered about 1,100 catch basins. We removed snow from about 233 kilometers of laneways, uh, sorry, roadways, and we'll continue to work on that. Uh, until this storm, we can clean this up. If you are still having issues with snow in your neighborhood, you can call the city at 311 to try and get them to come and fix it. But they did tell me as well that a big part of the responsibility is also on homeowners. You want to check your drain spout for debris. You want to make sure that you're shoveling the snow away from your house so if it starts to melt, it's not going to flood into your basement. And you want to be checking these guys. These are the sewer grates uh, that can often fill with debris and you want to make sure those are clear on your street so when that water starts melting it has a place to go. Especially as you heard with this forecast where we're expecting a little bit of rain. Dwight? Yeah, news you can use. Important advice out there. Thank you, Lauren. He gave up his seat on an overbooked flight. In exchange, Air Canada said they'd give him an $800 voucher. But the next day, that deal changed drastically. 
His story and his warnings to other air travelers, next. The airline offered up compensation. The passenger accepted it. Um, it's not open to the airline to say, well, we don't really like that deal anymore, and so we'd like to change it. That's just wrong. Uh, as, as a business professor, I consider that to be uh, a marketing fail. The weather update is brought to you by Train Extreme Conditions Testing. It's hard to stop a train, really hard. Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. We've all seen the stories about overbooked flights when there are more passengers than available seats. Well, tonight we've got the story of a man who says he thought he was doing the right thing by volunteering to give up his seat on an overbooked Air Canada flight, only to have the airline backtrack on the compensation it promised. Erica Johnson has this Go Public investigation. Every customer experience matters. Daniel Chai is teaching his business students about customer service, a lesson he created after a recent experience with Air Canada. It's all about trusting and respecting your customers. He was traveling from Vancouver to Toronto, but his flight was overcrowded. It was just pandemonium. There were people sitting on the floor. There were babies crying. It was, the whole place was just full of people. Chai says he volunteered to give up his seat and take a later flight in exchange for a $600 voucher, which he says was increased to $800 later that day. And I thought, wow, this is a great gesture by Air Canada. They stepped up. They're really rewarding people for voluntarily giving up their seats. 
as they should. But when Air Canada emailed him the next day, it offered only a 15% discount off a future flight, not $800. I think that's just wrong. Uh, as, as a business professor, I consider that to be uh, a marketing fail. This is what you're not supposed to do when you treat customers. After he pushed back in an email, Air Canada replied offering on an exceptional basis a $300 coupon as a goodwill gesture. But an expert in contract law says a verbal promise, in this case for $800, is a binding contract. The airline offered up compensation, the passenger accepted it. Uh, it's not open to the airline to say, well, we don't really like that deal anymore and so we'd like to change it. This air passenger rights advocate says giving up your seat on an overcrowded flight can be risky. I generally recommend passengers not to volunteer to give up their seats because we hear too many cases like this one where air passengers have difficulty then getting the compensation they were promised. Air Canada declined an interview request, but after Go Public contacted the airline, it did send Daniel Chai another voucher, this one for $500, adding up to the $800 he says he was owed. Erica Johnson, CPC News, Vancouver. Police in York Region say 21 drivers were charged with impaired related offenses in this past week alone. They highlighted one incident by releasing dashcam video of a person who fell asleep at a drive through The video shows officers smashing, smashing rather, the passenger side window after knocking on it repeatedly in an attempt to wake the driver up. Police were called to the restaurant in Aurora around 5 yesterday afternoon. The car was running with the driver passed out inside. The man tested four times above the legal limit for alcohol. I'm Farah Morali at Queen's Park, where these three leaked documents have now set off a firestorm. The NDP says they're proof the government is moving to privatize more health care services. The health minister says the NDP is just fear-mongering. I'll have more on the war of words that's brewing coming up.
Grizzly details coming to light as Bruce MacArthur's sentencing hearing got underway in a Toronto court today. His victims were restrained and sexually assaulted before they were killed. We learned investigators found hundreds of pictures on MacArthur's digital devices, some showing his victims staged in a fur coat and hat. MacArthur admitted last week to eight murders, the victims all connected to the gay village vanished, vanished rather, between 2010 and 2017. Undoubtedly a difficult day for friends and family members of the murdered men, some of them delivering victim impact statements as part of today's hearing. Ali Shiasan is live tonight at the University Avenue Courthouse. And Ali, today we really got a sense of just how many people were affected personally by these murders. That's right. Now, when you think of the victims in this case, you, of course, think of the eight men. You don't necessarily think of the other lives that have been so deeply affected by this. I am, of course, referring to the friends and family here. Uh, and today we got a glimpse into their sorrow, starting with Salim Essen's family. Uh, they said, quote, we can't come to terms with his savage murder. We also find it hard to believe that the killing of eight innocent gay persons went unnoticed noticed for eight years. They went on to say that they hope his uh, friends keep his memory alive and that the LGBTQ community will be able to live without fear. Now, we also heard from Dean Lisowick's daughter. We did not know he had a daughter. He was a homeless man here in Toronto, and she said she never met her father. Here is uh, a bit of their uh, the statement that was read on her behalf. I have a child and a baby on the way, and unfortunately, one day they will ask about my father and where he is, and I'll have to tell them how he was taken away from the world. Now, we also heard from uh, Andrew Kinsman's friends and family. Uh, his sisters said that they have uh, trouble trusting anybody in their circle uh, these days. And um, they went on to describe the uh, void that is in their lives. Uh, we also heard from uh, Skanda Navaratnam's uh, friends as well, saying the same kind of thing, that uh, the, the void is, um, is, is unbearable for them to live with. Uh, something I want to make mention as well is that Bruce MacArthur, he kept his head down throughout the proceedings today, except when the victim impact statements uh, were read. That's when he lifted his head up and listened to each person who spoke today. We will hear more victim impact statements read tomorrow. Dwight. Thank you, Ali. An Ontario public servant has been fired after a leak to the NDP. The NDP, which released the documents, claim they are proof of the PC's plan to move towards privatization of health care services in this province. Now, the health minister is again accusing the party of fear-mongering. Farah Morelli joins us live now. Far, what's the government now saying about these documents? Well, Dwight, on these documents specifically, not a whole lot. They're sticking to the messaging that we heard last week, which you just mentioned there, that the NDP is fear-mongering. This entire transformation plan has not yet been finalized. And the Minister went as far, or Minister of Health went as far today as to say that a lot of these documents haven't even crossed her desk. One thing the government did confirm, though, that the person behind these leaks is out of a job tonight. What we've decided to do is make these documents public because Mr. Ford is not telling the people of Ontario the truth. Four days after the NDP leaked government draft legislation, leader Andrea Horvath came back swinging. Well, it's very clear, in fact, that the documents uh, outline specifically a number of areas uh, where they are saying they will definitely privatize. Three documents in total were leaked by the NDP today. Two with the word confidential written on the cover. They make specific reference to Cabinet approving the full integrated care transformation plan and lists the date of January 16th. It also shows that the interim board for the agency and their pay have been signed off and approved by the minister. One document makes specific reference to outsourcing services like inspections, laboratory, licensing and even the air ambulance service Orange. I will not be distracted by Andrea Horvath's shallow partisan attempts to politicize health care. Today, the health minister fired back saying just what she said last week. We will not be privatizing any of the services referenced today by Andrea Horvath. In fact, the document that she released today was an internal, nonpartisan public service document, which I have never seen. 
The minister did concede some aspects of its plan to transform the health care system have been approved, but which ones she wouldn't say. What has been approved by cabinet and what is not passed? She walked out as reporters threw that question to her. One thing the government would confirm, it's not taking the leaks lightly. A memo from the head of the Ontario Public Service confirmed the person behind the leak has been fired, saying, I'm writing to confirm that as a result of our investigation into this matter, the employee responsible for this breach is no longer employed in the Ontario Public Service. The Ontario Provincial Police have also been notified. A move that's prompting some to question what's in the leaks. There's government documents leaked all the time, municipally, federally, provincially, and it very rarely leads to people being fired or to, you know, the police being called in to investigate. And I think that it's being done here because the dirt that's been dug up, for lack of a better term, um, has real meaning to it. So far, what is the NDP saying about how they got these documents? Well, as you imagine, Dwight, they weren't saying very much, especially considering this is now the subject of an investigation. But Horvath was asked today as well whether she thinks the party did enough to protect the source behind these leaks, to which she didn't comment either. What's going to be interesting is to see whether the party has more documents up its sleeve. This is, of course, the second leak in two weeks. Uh, Horvath wouldn't say definitively whether or not they do have any more uh, documents that they plan to release. Thank you, Farah. The Ford government is calling for an end to steel and aluminum tariffs that are impacting the province's economy. We want tariffs removed on both sides of the border uh, when it comes to steel and aluminum. As a result of these Economic tariffs, Development Minister Todd Smith to says Canada should remove the tariffs it imposed on steel and aluminum coming into Canada from the U.S. Those tariffs were put in place last year after the Trump administration slapped a 25% tariff on imported steel and 10% on imported aluminum. Smith says Ontario's steel and aluminum sectors are fighting to survive as a result and jobs are being lost. He is calling on Ottawa to drop its retaliatory tariffs in hopes the U.S. will do the same. As Venezuela marks the anniversary of the first coup led by Hugo Chavez, the country's current political crisis continues to develop. International support for the opposition leader is growing and pressure for Nicolas Maduro to step down is mounting inside the country. Adrian Arsenault is in Venezuela and spoke with people who lived through the coup 27 years ago. You've probably heard of charities where people who can no longer care for infants drop them at the front door. That's what happens here with the elderly. So it happens all over the country, but at this charity in particular, which only cares for men, they say that sometimes people, families who are leaving the country come here with very heavy hearts and leave their parents at the door. Some of the men you see here were architects, uh, accountants. They tell us they were waiters. Some supported Chavez, some supported Maduro, some tried really hard to stay out of politics altogether. But what they all say, what they all agree on right now is that something and someone has to be better than what they're dealing with. They're short of everything here, certainly short of food, but especially short of medicine, which is why you see signs like that. The Pharmaceutical Association says 85% of the medication in Venezuela is in short supply. So here's a guide for how to make your own using vinegar and water to deal with infections. Judging by the illnesses we see here, that's not going to do it, but it's, it's all they have. While we were here today, uh, Juan Guaido, the opposition figure, was on the radio and we watched a few people listening to him. One man in particular started crying in the middle of, of Guaido's press conference and we asked him why. It wasn't clear if he was crying because maybe he was happy. But he said no, he, he was afraid that Maduro's people would be killing Guaido, that that's what happened to this man's son. Other people say they are allowing themselves to hope for change, and others are more pragmatic, saying that they believe change will come, but it will be slow, and if you happen to live here, quite possibly too slow. The Prime Minister hosted an international meeting in Ottawa today to address the escalating situation in Venezuela. The Lima Group is composed of countries trying to facilitate a peaceful transition of power from President Nicolas Maduro to the self-declared interim president, opposition leader Juan Guaido. Julie Van Dusen joins us now from Ottawa. So, Julie, take us through what happened at this meeting. Well, the Prime Minister kicked off the meeting with the news that Canada would contribute $53 million towards um, feeding and clothing and uh, helping refugees who have fled the country. There's been about 3 million of them that have gone to neighboring countries. Some of those countries are part of the Lima Group. 
uh, for example, uh, Peru, Colombia, Brazil. So they've had to absorb uh, this, this, uh, this influx of people because of this conflict. Now, today their message was basically that they want to see a peaceful transition away from Maduro, who they call a dictator, to Juan Guaido, um, who is the self-described interim president who spoke to them by video link and who has promised a peaceful transition to democracy. By the day's end, they have incorporated or welcomed him as a member of the Lima Group. And let's listen to the prime minister a little earlier today saying why Maduro has to go. The use of excessive force against peaceful protesters, arbitrary detentions, extrajudicial killings, all have become staples of a dictatorship clinging to power at the expense of their people. So, Julie, the Lima Group agrees they all want a peaceful transition, but what happens if Maduro decides that he's not going to step down? Well, certainly that has been the case so far, right, Dwight? And he is still, for the most part, backed by the military. So it's a question everyone is grappling with. The United States, Donald Trump, has suggested that military action is an option to dislodge Maduro. Uh, but the United States is not part of the Lima Group. However, its ambassador, Kelly Kraft, was here today. Mike Pompeo, the secretary of state, called in, dialed into the meeting. Um, I asked Juan Guaido's representative here at the Lima Group on his way in, what he thought of the idea of military intervention to get rid of Madero. Take a listen. I'm pro any any measure that could bring Venezuela freedom and liberty, and military intervention. It's a it's a curiosity, but it's a Maduro's decision, and he have to to take if he want a peaceful transition, or he wants to be radical and violent as he has been. So just to note, Dwight, um, Canada's role in all this, hosting this event, talking about, uh, you know, the transition to uh, Guaido is certainly a controversial one with some groups, some labor groups, the CLC and QP, are saying Canada should not interfere with the sovereignty of Venezuela and should reject especially any attempt by the U.S. for military intervention. Everybody hoping for a peaceful end to this one. Julie Van Dusen, senior reporter at CBC's Parliamentary Bureau in Ottawa. Thank you, Julie. You're welcome. The group that makes the Canadian Heritage Minutes videos wants an apology from the Conservative Party. They're upset about a political attack ad aimed at Prime Minister Trudeau and the Liberals. In over 150 years, Canada has had many Prime Ministers. Justin Trudeau had made history, unfortunately. The Conservative spoof was made in a similar style to Historica Canada's mini history videos. The nonprofit group says it welcomes parodies but does not want them used for partisan political purposes. The video was taken down but then reposted with a message stating it's a parody. Historica says even with the disclaimer, the Conservative ad runs counter to the spirit of the minutes. The CBC is joining in Black History Month celebrations with an online page dedicated to stories about being black in Canada. One of those stories looks at the life of businesswoman Viola Desmond. She's the first Canadian-born woman to appear on the country's $10 bill, and no one is happier about that than her sister, Wanda Robson. I want to pinch myself. I, I am so proud and so happy. I never dreamed that all this, uh, this journey, I will call it, for, about Viola, we've come to this heights, and I have so many people to thank. Go to our special website to see years of content that brings the black experience to a national audience. It's at cbc.ca slash being black in Canada. Stay with us, we'll be right back.
The Lunar New Year kicks off tomorrow, and there was a celebration today at City Hall to ring in the Year of the Pig. <laughs> to take this opportunity then to wish everyone good health, happiness and prosperity in 2019 and the year of the pig. I can only say that when it comes to the good nature and the peace and the joy uh, of the pig in the year of the pig that we're about to begin, doesn't the world need more peace and good nature and joy and prosperity? And I hope that that's what will come uh, in 2019. The Lunar New Year reception was co-hosted by the mayor and the Toronto Chinese Business Association. Now, according to tradition, the year of the pig will bring joy, friendship, good fortune and trust the mayor and Chinese business leaders took part in an eye-dotting ceremony to wake up the sleeping dragon for the new year. And it was a nice day for a celebration, indoors and outdoors, Colette, but I think that uh, this warm-up is not going to last. And you would be right about that, Dwight. Yeah, it's not going to last, but we did have some record heat today. And by the way, you know what they say about pigs, this being the year of the pig? I think it's a good thing that dogs look up to you, cats look down on you, pigs will look you directly in the eye. I, I'm a fan of pigs, but also dogs and cats, uh, truth be told. Average height this time of year is minus 2.2. Today's high 12.2. The record from 1991 was 11 degrees at Pearson, so it is a new record for us. And yeah, look at our average low. Well, we were way above that for us in terms of even our low temperature, just six degrees for an overnight low. The temperatures out there now, they're falling off, but very, very gently. So it's 9 degrees in Toronto. It's still 13 in St. Catharines as these rain showers are moving through. There are some pockets back here towards Kitchener where we've got some heavier doses, and those will be coming through the area. So at times, maybe periods where it's a little heavier, but mostly it's going to be light showery activity and it moves through and mostly will be out of the GTA by midnight or just beyond around 1 a.m. there. Then tomorrow we'll see kind of a mix of sun and cloud through the area, but for southwestern Ontario, the system that's approaching, there is already a special weather statement because of the freezing rain risk. And as we go into Wednesday morning, that freezing rain or freezing drizzle likely coming into the GTA could affect the commute maybe a little bit later, but then extending off and on throughout the day, we have that risk of seeing freezing rain and even freezing drizzle, freezing rain, potentially into Thursday before the temperature comes up enough to turn it over to rain showers. So at least we're staying above seasonal, but we've got to deal with slick conditions. Overnight tonight, the temperature dropping to around zero or minus one and then tomorrow afternoon most of our highs with variable skies into the afternoon right there around one degree Markham zero however in St. Catharines right around two degrees so still staying above seasonal but that special weather statement from Environment Canada for now is for southwestern Ontario for the freezing rain but I think we'll likely see some statements coming out tomorrow or watches and warnings that may extend into the GTA so we'll be up on that for you a look at the temperatures, though, staying mild until we get towards the weekend, and then they're really going to start to fall off once again. So at least staying above seasonal, but we're going to have to deal with some very slick roadways and sidewalks, plus all the melting we've been seeing, Dwight. So a lot going on out there. It's a mess. Thank you, Colette. You're welcome. Shoot for the stars. Feels right in my so that happened in the middle of what was a pretty bland Super Bowl. Folks calling it a Super Bowl. Maroon 5 took to the stage for the halftime show. Why today lead singer Adam Levine is thanking his haters. Coming up next.
Maroon 5 performing in last night's Super Bowl halftime show. Before the game even began, there was a debate about whether the group should have decided to perform during a controversial year. Other musicians had turned down the gig in support of Colin Kaepernick. He's the former NFL quarterback who decided to take a knee during the national anthem to draw attention to police brutality. Now, the show did go on, and now it's time to talk about how it all will be remembered. Yelena Ezek is here. Will it be remembered? Hmm. Yes, and I did watch the Super Bowl last night. So ah, I haven't heard that today. We'll, That's we'll great. get to the halftime <laughs> show right now. What stood out for you? Listen, what stood out for me, Dwight? Is, are you setting this up? <laughs> what stood out for everyone? Adam Levine's. Yes, you know what I'm going to say there. That's what stood out. It's painted on six pack. <laughs> oh, yeah. Listen, a lot of people talking about this and about some possible double standards in the works here. I mean, it was obviously years ago that we saw what happened with Jan Janet Jackson mm -hmm. and what's now known as Nipplegate mm -hmm. and coining the term wardrobe malfunction. This whole thing was a malfunction, according <laughs> to some critics. Adam, put your shirt on. <laughs> Listen, this is a, a tweet just that exemplified a lot of the different ones that were out there. Friendly reminder that Janet Jackson got blacklisted <laughs> for doing what Adam Levine just did pretty much for the entire time of the show. Uh, now, okay, a lot of people, they were critical of him for various different reasons. Uh, some people just didn't feel that he brought it in terms of energy for the show. Other people just felt like, you know, the bar is set so high when you think of the orchestration of someone like Beyonce's performance right. or even Katy Perry. It really, you know, some people are saying it just didn't bring it on that level. And then other people criticized him just for the fact that they were wondering, is he maybe going to make some kind of a stance or at least honor Kaepernick Something, in some way, right? shape or form? Not only did he not, Big Boy, as well as Travis Scott, the co-performers, they also didn't address it in any way. But you know what? Adam Levine decided I don't care what people say. Here's what I have to say. So here's the post that he ended up sharing. We thank the universe for this historic opportunity to play on the world's biggest stage. We thank our fans for making our dreams possible. And we thank our critics for always pushing us. And then it ends with to do better. Uh, some people, you know, there's a, some debate as to whether or not they could have done even better. Instead of taking off the shirt, how about putting on a Kaepernick jersey? But all right, I digress. He did <laughs> reference his critics there. So what did the critics have to say? Yeah, I'm laughing because you mentioned Kaepernick jersey. Uh, you know, we, there were a lot of different celebrities that did come out at various times throughout the weekend to show support for Kaepernick. I'm going to give you a look at a picture that was sent out. This is of uh, LeBron, LeBron James, yeah. as well as Kevin Durant, and they are wearing the jersey number seven. And a lot of people have been using the hashtag to say, I'm with Cap. We know earlier, uh, Ava DuVernay, for example, the director, she said, there is no way I'm attending. There is no way I'm watching. I just don't think it's a appropriate at all. You know, there was a tweet also sent out from Common, and this one was interesting because he quoted Dr. Angela Davis, just, I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things I cannot accept. And that was also an I'm with Cap type of a tweet. So, um, so yeah, that's what a lot of people were saying in, in on that one hand of it. Mm -hmm. And then on the other is just a lot of people either upset about the, the fact that, you know, Janet Jackson might have gotten a raw deal here, and, and that others were hoping that his performance would have perhaps been a little bit more lively. So, Lots of different ding, ding, dings going around. And, you know, there's always going to be some fans that are happy no matter what. But uh, overall, they just, people are feeling this is maybe one of the more lackluster performances of the Super Bowl halftime. If you boycotted, you didn't miss anything. Thanks, Yelena. Bye, Dwight. <laughs> Sorry, I'm causing trouble today. You tell it like it is. <laughs>
all your Shosho GT shots don't have to be pretty. They can give you <laughs> pictures of what is happening in your GTA. And that was a problem with our GTA Snowy Streets last week near King Street. Thank you to, I think it was David who sent that one in. Get your photos to us by posting them on Twitter or Instagram with the hashtag CBC your GTA. And of course, we'll air some of them on the show. We've got about 40 seconds to mm. talk about this warm up. For, sorry, the warm up is done about the end of this warm up. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, that was kind of pretty what we just saw there. And now it's a mess out there yes. because of the mild temperatures, all the melting we're seeing. Overnight tonight, we do have these evening showers. Those will pass through ending overnight. Zero for the low. Tomorrow afternoon, it's still above seasonal, but uh, 11 degrees off today's high. Ooh. One tomorrow afternoon, becoming a mix of sun and cloud. And then the system we'll be watching carefully. That's going to be coming in for Wednesday. With with the freezing rain risk. Mother Nature keeping you on your toes, oh, Carl. Lots <laughs> going on. That's our show for tonight. Thank you for joining us. Mike Wise has your next local news tonight at 11. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 6.